I don't think so. I think I'm just going to chill. And uh, hi, you guys. Thanks for coming back out tonight. You must be thirsty and hungry. Thirsty and hungry. Communion. Thirsty and hungry. So, um, hey, Holy Spirit. Um, wow. We're getting that close. I say, hey. Um, <laughs> um, you know, have your way with every one of us tonight, anything less than your opinion, your agenda, your thought would be an inappropriate expression of the evening. So we yield, um, you know, completely. Um, and, where, and, and, and maybe where we're lacking in the completely part, um, can you teach us how to yield completely? You know, that's our invitation. Have your way. Have your way tonight. In Jesus' name, beautiful name. The beauty about the Holy Spirit is, is he makes everything more lovable. It really does. Holy Spirit is like MSG for, oh, that's ooh, that's ooh, that's ooh. That, no, not MSG. See, I think MSG makes things taste better and look better, right? Isn't that what the MSG? It's just horrible for you. Okay, so Holy Spirit, it just makes things look better, but it's really, he's really good for you. He's really good for you tastes really good. I was thinking today he actually is the taste, right? Holy Spirit is actually our our ability to sense and taste that the Lord is good. That's really, he excites our senses. He is the part of the Godhead that actually comes and associates with us and is, dwells with us and, and, and pricks our heart and awakens things in us. And so, um, Holy Spirit, would you um, just, just meet us individually, meet us corporately um, at that place, wherever we are at in our journey, wherever, wherever that is, um, we invite you, we invite you, as you've been inviting us, we invite you uh, to, for, for, to have an encounter with us as we have an encounter with you, in Jesus' name. So in Acts chapter 2, because this is where it all began. If we're going to talk about communion, you can't talk about communion ding, <laughs> without talking about Jesus, obviously. But the reality is, is communion didn't exist until Holy Spirit came. They had the Last Supper leading into, right? The Last Supper leading into, it was the prerequisite to what we would experience after the resurrection because he was teaching his apostles because the apostles were going to teach all of us going forward. They continued in the apostles' teachings. Teach them everything that I have taught you, that I've shown you. Have them become aware of everything that I've shown you. And so now we take what Jesus did on the, on, on, before the cross. The apostles and Holy Spirit actually delivered on the other side of the cross. That makes sense. So let's start. Let's start in Acts, in Acts two, um, chapter or chapter two, verse thirty-two. Can't you see it? Can't you see it? God has resurrected Jesus, and we have all seen him. That's the first hurrah of the day. You and I have the ability, because of Holy Spirit, to actually have encounters with Jesus. We can actually see him. The Bible says, and we all know this verse, that, <laughs> right, John? <laughs> we all know this, that when two or three are gathered in his name, where is he? He's right, his, the, his manifest presence actually shows up. The only hindrance to us seeing him is our hindrance. We're, <laughs> I, was, I was talking to my wife earlier before the service tonight, and I said, you know, I've had the Holy Spirit in measure. And I've experienced the Holy Spirit in a limited fashion. But I'd like to propose to all of us tonight that Jesus the Father, and Holy Spirit are actually available in full measure. 
to those who actually want the full measure. The only thing that ever stops us from more of him is our lack of desire for more of him. Satan can't stop us. The enemy can't stop us. Our, 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 the opinions of man can't stop us. The only thing that actually limits him is whatever limit we place on him. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. So they go on. So we have the ability. We actually we have the ability to hear his voice because we are his sheep. And we have the ability to actually encounter him, see him, right? Engage with him. Why? Because he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's with us always. We have Holy Spirit available to us to reveal who Jesus is. And then Jesus has this, a beautiful, this beautiful assignment of being a bridge to get us as an advocate between the Father and us so that he says, now you can approach boldly. <laughs> you can go in and say, hey, Dad, what's up? In all the reverence in the world. Okay? Then God, this is verse uh, 33, then God exalted him to his right hand upon the throne of the highest honor, and the Father gave him the authority to send the promised Holy Spirit, which is actually now being poured out on all of us today. This is what you're seeing, and this is what you're hearing. So I wanted to propose to you something as Holy Spirit comes on Journey Center as Holy Spirit comes on you individually, something's got to change. People have, there has, there has to be a recognizable encounter that you're having. People, they, not recognizable. They may not be able to define that it's Holy Spirit. They may think you're drunk, right? We know that, right? That's part of the, what, what goes on. But something, they will know that they'll look at you and they'll say, something's happened to you. You've must have been, you must have been with Jesus or you must have been with Holy Spirit or you must have had, Moses had an encounter with God and he got white hair. There I go, there's my proof. But something, something, listen, listen, Holy Spirit, when he shows up, something's gotta be better. Something's gotta be kinder. Something's got to awaken in you. There's, you. You can't have an encounter with him and not have something change. Does that make sense? Okay, we good? <clears throat> David wasn't the one, verse 34, David wasn't the one who ascended into heaven, but he was the one who prophesied. That's pretty good company, ascending into heaven or prophesying. If you're going to have a couple comparisons, right, Paul said, I wish you all would prophesy. We learned this morning that all of us are prophets. All of us are kings. All of us are priests. In fact, I'd like to propose to you that every single human being on the earth are sons and daughters of God. Some of them are lost. Some of them are found. Yeah? You can't lose something unless you first own something. Okay? This helps you to see people. This helps you to see yourself. Because this is, this is all playing right up to communion. The Lord Jehovah said to my Lord, I honor you by enthroning you beside me until I make your enemies a footstool beneath, my feet, beneath your feet. Now everyone, say everyone, everyone in Israel can know for certain Everyone at Journey Center can know for certain. Everyone in Elmira can know for certain. Everyone in Horseheads can know for certain that Jesus, ready for this? Whom you crucified. We can blame a lot of people, blame a lot of things, but the more encounter that you have with Holy Spirit, the more understanding of the value of the crucifixion that Jesus provided for us and the cost that he provided for us and the fact that he had to do it because he didn't just take upon our sins, he became sin for me. I don't have anybody who loves me that way. 
Yes, God, I'll take, up, I'll take all of your garbage. I'll take all of your slang. I'll take all of your cursing. I'll take, I'll take all of your attitude. I'll take all of your thoughts that are horrible. I'll take all of your anger. I'll take all, I'll take all of that. So I'm going to take that all. I'm going to take it all on me. Oh, and by the way, I'm pure. I'm perfect. But I love you so much, and I want you free, Scott. I want you free. I'm willing to take it all upon myself and die as you. So that you can be free. Wow. You see why we shouldn't just flippantly take communion? You guys okay? Okay. So then the crowd responds. <laughs> the crowd responds to his words. I'd like to propose that we should have a response. But my question is always, when he speaks, what is our, our response going to be? And the, and the crowd says, when, when they heard this, they were crushed. When I read that, I said, man, I'm feeling that way. It should bother us that we wounded him. It should bother us that he was bruised beaten, chunks of his body got ripped from his, 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 his skeleton for me. Those were my stripes. Those were my beatings. Those were, huh. does that make sense? These people were crushed, and they realized what they had actually done to Jesus. These are the people that are having encounters with the Holy Spirit. Deeply moved, they said to Peter and to the other apostles, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? At this moment in time, what is my responsibility for this? See, we can't stand before God. We can't stand in life and point the finger that it's their fault, their fault, their fault. I'm in this place because of them. We've got to, at some point, we've got to step out of the victim mentality, out of the poverty mentality, step into our kingship and say, see, because kings understand how to rule. Kings understand authority, so kings understand faith. So kings understand the fact that, listen, I am responsible. There's responsibility that comes along with that. What are we going to do with it? So what are we going to do with it? This is what... This is what the early, early church said. What do we do with this? And Peter replied, change the way you're thinking. Return to God. Each one of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus. Watch this. Who's the anointed one? Why? So you can have all that yucky stuff removed. Get free. Get clean. Be done with that thinking. Then, say then, then, watch this, you may take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm, see the order of things. You awaken to reality, you deal with reality, you confront reality, and then you step into a new reality because you're a new creation and you say, what was done no longer needs to be talked about. I'm completely forgiven. Let's move on into that which you now have for me. So now that I am clean, cleansed, baptized, washed, whiter than snow, come, Holy Spirit. Well, stay with the order, if you would. For God's promise of the Holy Spirit is actually for you. Who's it for? Who, who's it for? It's for each one of us. It is for the promise and the gift of the Holy Spirit actually isn't for somebody else only. It isn't just for the people who speak. It isn't just for the people who teach. It isn't just for the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. It's not just for those goody two shoes. It's for, it's for me. I'd, for me. For me. For me. Mm. Only Jesus. You know, you know, that's right. For me. <laughs> it always, isn't it always though, Sean? <laughs> well, 
Watch this. You know the reason that the Holy Spirit, that we don't take hold of him? is because we don't recognize that we're completely every bit whole and forgiven. See, this thing of worthiness is a big deal, even in communion. This whole series is so God-breathed. I can't even tell you how God-breathed this whole series has been. Of his worthiness, of our worthiness, of their worthiness. Why? Mm. Then you may take hold of the gift. For God's promise of the Holy Spirit is for you. Hey, it's for your families. Hey, it's for those that, aren't, that are born, that are not yet born. What? We're doing baby dedications. Holy Spirit's got to be welcome in the house because we got babies coming. We got generations coming. Holy Spirit is waiting for them because Holy Spirit isn't just for me. Holy Spirit isn't just for the elite. Holy Spirit is for those that aren't even here yet. For those yet to be born and for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Guess what? What is his will? That none should perish. But that all should have what? Everlasting life. Everyone. Got to make room. Got to make a place. They got to be welcome home. The prodigals are coming home when Holy Spirit has his way. How do I know? 500 started, 120 stayed. One got up and spoke. 3,000 came in that day. That day. 120,000 within that year when Holy Spirit showed up. Why do you think the enemy does not want Holy Spirit in you or in your families or in your church? Peter preached to them and warned them with these words, be rescued from the wayward and perverse culture of the world. Do you know what the world means there? It does not mean the world. It actually meant the church. The religious organization of the day. He was talking to these people in Jerusalem. He was talking to the religious community. Those who believed the word, watch this, that day numbered 3,000. They were all baptized and they were all added to the church. That's a pretty good altar call. 120, one speaks, 3,000 here, they receive, they're added to the number that day. Now watch, this is where we start. This is where we begin this is where communion as the church, as the church is launched, it, it was as a part of the ordinances of the early church right from the very beginning. Every believer, here's the order of things. Watch how this flows. Every believer was faithfully devoted to, the follow, to following the teachings. Hear that? Not just listening to the teachings. You only actually believe that which you do. If you really believe something, then, 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 then the function of that belief system is, 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 is in the works from the faith that you've received, okay? So following the teachings of the apostles, watch this. This is important pieces, you guys, important pieces, into what we're doing tonight. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another. Watch this. Sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. A deep sense, at, now, as a result of those things, a deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone. As a result of that, the apostles were able to perform many miraculous signs and wonders. Do you see the, do you see the trend line here, right? All the believers, all the believers, how many of them? All the believers... We're in fellowship as one body. And they shared with one another whatever they had. When Holy Spirit comes on the scene, there's a unity and there's a generosity and there's a oneness that's established where you literally, you don't have to work at caring for one another's needs. You actually, it actually is generated from that 
relationship, that encounter that you actually have with Holy Spirit. It's not a duty. Duty. It's actually a, a privilege. There's a melting of hearts. There's a, there's a, there's, there's that, there's that ability to literally take the time, just take the time and be present and sense one another's burdens. So how often did they do this? All the believers were in fellowship with one body and they shared with one another whatever they, whatever they had. Out of, genera- out of generosity, they even sold their assets to distribute to the proceeds to those who were in need among them daily. How often? Daily. daily. How often? Daily. daily. We got to see each other every day? They couldn't wait to see each other every day. Daily, huh, they wanted to be with each other daily. They met together. Where in the temple courts, we got kind of a temple court out there now. Got a tennis court, we got a, this is whatever you want. Well, you know, basketball court. And, and watch this, and, in, and they, they did that, and in one another's homes, to do what? To celebrate communion. That's how this whole thing got launched. Jesus had just died a few days and rose again a few days earlier, but they didn't want to forget it. Now why? Why is that so important that we don't forget what he did for us? And I, I shared this with Lise before sharing it with you. Now, I believe one of the reasons is this. We live in a culture, humanity is this, has this mindset, what have you done for me lately? See, that encounter, that sacrifice, that act of love that he did for us back there, if we don't keep it front and center, then we're going to need to have some other thing replace the greatest thing he ever did for us. No greater love ever expressed by God or man. No greater love. Communion remembers that act of greatness. I mean, 2001, the towers, right, 2001, the towers went down, and we said we'd never forget. The celebrations have lessened and lessened and lessened and lessened and lessened over the years. He knew that the thing that would hold us and keep us, even in our pursuit, even in our choices, would be, I, wanna, I, I need to remember, I need to remember that price that was paid for me, not just because how great you are, God, but I need to be reminded every day in a world that wants to destroy my identity who I am. I need to be reminded that I am worthy of such an amazing price because in that worthiness, I have the ability to stand up and applaud a great sacrifice because you consider me so valuable. That sacrifice would not have been made if you were worthless. But I don't know that we believe that. Do we believe that? Like, I don't, it's taken me a long time to actually believe, believe that, that price that was paid. Now, see, some people are struggling with that because, well, no, I'm, I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm not, nothing's, there's nothing good about me. There's nothing good except for Christ in me. I just, you know, you can say that, and, and maybe I could even agree with you <laughs> about that, about you and about me, but here's the reality. That's not his statement about us. That's not his declaration about us. No greater love has a man. Listen, listen. You're adored. You're loved. Communion is not just remembering his sacrifice, but it's remembering the value and the worth of that sacrifice that was given for me, which raises my value. When you feel valuable, you act valuable. When you see yourself as a king, then you act like a king. When you see yourself as a priest, you act like a priest, a prophet, you act like a prophet. When you see yourself as a son, that your father gave up a son so that he could have relationship with you as a son, you, you, you take that sonship very, very valuable. Is that 
Makes sense. So. It's funny that out of that whole time when they're together daily, they met together in the temple courts and with one another in, in their homes and they would celebrate communion. They shared meals together with joyful hearts and tender humility. They were continually filled with praises to God, enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were coming to life. See, celebrating Christ's death actually brings us life. But then something happened. In Corinthians, the early church started getting, started getting a little messed up. I just got to find my spot. This is Paul writing to the Corinthian church. He says, um, now on this next matter, which is about, oh, I'm sorry, let me get you there. 1 Corinthians 11, 17. 11, 17. Now, in this next matter, I wish I could commend you, but I cannot. <laughs> That's just the best way to start a letter from, from Holy Spirit to you. I wish I could commend you on this matter, but I cannot. Because, watch this, when you meet together as a church family, it's doing more harm than it is good. Ouch. I've been told many times that when you meet as a congregation, that's what I said to Paul was, you're listening to gossip, aren't you, Paul? I gotta get rid of my gum. Paul says, I've been told many times, I've been told many times that when you're getting together as a congregation, you got some junk going on. What's he, what's he, let's talk about the junk. I might have by the end of this. You got some divisions going on among you. Uh-oh. So what you're telling me is, is people who cause divisions, it'd be better if we just didn't have church. Well, yeah? No, I mean, what, how do you read it? When you guys are getting together... It'd be better, you're doing more harm getting together than if you just stayed apart. If you're going to have divisions, and oh, and then he says clicks, emerging. And then he goes this, and to some extent, that doesn't really surprise me. Difference of, differences of opinion are unavoidable. But this is what it does reveal, is what he says. What it does reveal is this. It tells us who among you actually have God's approval. What he's saying is this, in the midst of divisions, in the, in the midst of um, cliques, you're going to find out who the mature ones are. Because the mature ones don't engage in it. Yeah? That's a passion translation. It's so rude. Then he says this, and then, oh, and then all your house churches, your little getting togethers in your houses and stuff. That's cool, but when you get together as a church family, you're not really properly celebrating the Lord's Supper. Why? Because you got all this division and clicky stuff going on. Well, this is my group. This is what we do. We're spiritual. You're not so spiritual over there in your group. We got a lot of spiritual stuff over here, but not you. No, oh, man, it's like we all are at different points in our journey, and it's okay. I would like to say this. What determines whether you're spiritual or not is are you listening to the impulses of the Holy Spirit? That's really all. What spirit are you under if you're causing division? Not holy. A mature person actually operates in the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, kindness. And so I just feel like for me, it took me 56 years to figure out I wanted to grow up. That's my confession. And I'll do it publicly. 
because conviction makes me feel really good. I don't feel condemned because I, I'm childish in a lot of my... But here's the thing. I had a little boy inside of me. I don't know about you. For you ladies, this, you won't relate to this, but I had a little boy inside of me that just, just was not able to grow up because he remembers being a little boy being abused and beaten down or you know, not really worth much and that kind of stuff. But, but Holy Spirit has the ability to awaken the mature son in you. A place where you can't be robbed from anymore. A place where you don't have to be a victim anymore. A place where you can't, don't have to blame anymore. It's just a beautiful place. And here's the beauty of it. Holy Spirit does an expedited, accelerated work in you. You don't have to wait for years to actually grow up like you do in the natural. But, I, but to be honest with you, we watch Levi, you know, be Levi immature. To like, where'd this man come from? It, was all, it seemed like almost overnight. No, it wasn't, but it seemed like that. that was, that's true in the natural, but, but you know, all it requires, this is all it requires. This is the only thing that I, that I, from my experience, is all it requires. Do you mean it when you say yes? If you did, then he does. But you can't mess and you can't fool with God. Oh, yeah, I told God I was fully in and I'm in, but it didn't work out. Well, if it didn't work out, then you weren't fully in. There are no victims in the kingdom of God. None. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to have hurts. But in the context of that, in the context of that, like I said this morning, if you can not grieve the Holy Spirit for one second, then you cannot grieve the Holy Spirit the rest of your life. Just remember that rhythm. Remember what that sense feels like when you're in sync with his heart. And then do everything to stay there. Because the enemy is going to want to get you out of that rhythm. Right? And I believe that communion is a part of that. Watch, watch this. He says, to, um, goes on, uh, all your house churches, okay, for when it comes time to eat, some gobble down their food before anything is given to others. <laughs> One is left hungry while others are getting drunk just to prove to you that they did drink grape juice for communion. So don't you all have homes where you can eat and drink? Don't you realize that you're showing a superior attitude by humiliating those who have nothing? Are you trying to show contempt for God's beloved church? How should I address this appropriately? If you're looking for my approval, uh, you won't find it. I have handed down to you, watch this, I've handed down to you what came to me by direct revelation from the Lord himself. And this is what he handed down to them. This is what I believe the Lord would like to hand down to us tonight. The same night in which he was handed over, he took the bread and he gave thanks. Then he distributed it to the disciples and he said, take it and eat your fill. This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Then he did the same with the cup of wine after supper and said, this cup seals, there's a, sealing, a seal that happens. It seals the new covenant that I'm making with you. It's sealed by my blood. So drink it. And whenever you drink it, do it to remember me. Whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you actually are retelling the story, proclaiming my death. Not resurrection. This is different. Proclaiming the Lord's death until when? Until he comes. For this reason, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in the wrong spirit will be guilty of dishonoring the body and the blood of the Lord. So let each individual first individually evaluate what's my attitude where am i at where's my heart at and then only then eat the bread and drink the cup because even his grace is in this 
continually eating and drinking with a wrong spirit will bring judgment upon yourself by not recognizing the body. This insensitivity is why, watch this, watch this. It's why many of you are weak, chronically ill, and some are even dying. If you do not sit in judgment of others, you will avoid judgment yourself. What would you say would be a good evaluation to see if we're sitting in the seat of a judge? Might that be a good place to start? How are we judging others? Right? It goes on. When we are judged, it is the Lord's training. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? Even grace in his judgment. Hey, I'm just trying to train you so that, so that we will not be condemned. See, his judgment isn't condemnation. His judgment actually frees us. It's a beautiful judgment. There's grace in his judgment. There's mercy. In fact, mercy triumphs over judgment. He, he releases such mercy that his judgment does not feel like judgment. You feel good when God's judging you. Why? Because, oh, he's teaching me. I'm learning something right now. You need to come out like, wow, I'm, I'm better today by his judgment than I was the day before without it. So then, my fellow believers, that's us, when you assemble as one to share a meal, show respect for one another. Wait until everyone's served. Yeah, but it might get cold. I know. If you are that hungry, eat at home first. I'd like to propose we all should be eating at home before we come to church so there's lots to lots to lots to go around in spiritual things. Come filled up and give. Huh. If you are hungry, okay, so that, so that when you gather together, you will not bring judgment upon yourself. Oh, so... By the way, when I come to you, I will answer all the rest of your crazy questions, Corinthian church, that you've asked me. I'm not going to do that in writing. I'm going to, that's what he said. I just, is he's just, I just, I love Paul. He's just beautiful. So, with that tonight, what I'd like to do is I would like us to actually um, not just take communion, but to experience communion. This is what I want to, this is what I want to point out and the main point I want to have tonight because I, I believe there's a, strategic alignment, there's a tie between communion and healing. And healing is a part of, what's the word, babe? Our, it's the children's bread. But it's going to be very important, you know. Let me back up, let me back up. I think the reason and I'm, this is my um, mindset change, but also my confession to you, I believe that I have been afraid of communion because if I would have had to honestly evaluate, so there's, a, there's an evaluation that you can make before the Lord that's honest, or there's an evaluation you can make in front of people that really isn't honest. But an honest evaluation has to have an honest reconciliation. I mean, once you eva see, once you are awakened to something that you need to reconcile, you should not move into taking communion until you're willing to move to that reconciliation. Now listen, with that said, with that said, today I feel really clean before the Lord. However, tomorrow I may need to reconcile something else once it awakens to my awareness that there's something else that I need to actually that there's conviction in, that I need to do something. This is, this is why communion is an ongoing thing. This is why relationship is an ongoing thing. This is why being refreshed and refilled by the Holy Spirit is an ongoing thing. It's not a one-time event. It's not a weekly event. This thing is a walk, a constant walk of repentance, a constant walk in love, a constant walk in awareness. Holy Spirit, I don't want to wait for a week to walk in that which is communion with you, Jesus, because of something I wasn't willing to evaluate when it was brought into con conviction 
easily just move right in that moment. I just gotta, I gotta talk about this. I gotta confess this. Find some place to just bring it because confession does this. Lisa and I talked about this too. Confession and conversation about those things that you are, are struggling with actually bring intimacy to a group of people, which is the body of Christ, which actually creates unity and it, and it shuts down gossip and those type of things. Why? Because you're not gonna talk about somebody that actually appreciate and love or that knows a whole lot of stuff about you. That's why you share in that. Everybody good with that so far? So for me, for me, um, when, I, when I had, you know, my yes, my honest yes with Holy Spirit, that began a conviction in me that I haven't had to deal with. But now I'm having, to, I'm having to reconcile a lot of things because his, the beauty of Holy Spirit is the beauty of his conviction. This I know. I am going to be a pure voice for him because I'm willing. I was willing to say yes to a conviction that he brings that is beautiful because in him you are completely safe. And this is what he wants for the church. He wants the church to be a safe place. He wants this family to be a safe place. Why? He wants us all clean. He wants us all free. He wants us all in communion. Community, communion, hmm? It's all about relationship, right? So tonight, the order of things as we do this together, and I, I went to Jubilee to get loaves of Italian bread and Obviously, they didn't know that we were doing communion tonight. They would have had it ready for us. But um, so I, 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 I don't have loaves, but I didn't want to do crackers. And since I've taken an oath to not drink alcohol, I had to get grape juice. But um, I'm, before we do this, oh, this is really fun. I did get Dixie cups. They look a little bit like shot glasses. Not that I know what shot glasses look like. This one's mine. And this one's for you guys. Um, but tonight, the order of things, I left all the Navox, but I don't know that she got it or not, so. That's all right. No condemnation in Christ Jesus. No, 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 no. What we're going to do is, I wanted um. I wanted the students to be prepared because what I'd like to do is this. This is the order of things. Um, at this end, at this end of the auditorium, as you individually go through, Sean, could you play a little uh, anointed music? Yeah. Try not to do any striper. All right. Striper? Um, at this end of the, at this end of the room, so for those, I'm sorry for those over there, but when you get done, you'll be right back to your seats. So uh, at this end of the room, I'd like you, as you are, first step is this, an individual, individual evaluation. So let's just do that in this moment. Let's just go, Father, reveal, reveal to us that which you want to um, reconcile with us. I don't know what that looks like, feels like for each one. I know what it is for me. But we want to be found right now clean. There's forgiveness of sins available in the blood of Jesus for the remission of sins. He's paid that price completely. For most of us, if you haven't settled that, settle that. many thoughts that's available to you that's, that's available for freedom, for deliverance from that that's also found in Sozo you can be free from things that want to own you complete freedom right, let's reconcile that and then there's physical healing available tonight let's prepare our hearts for that don't let any hindrance be in the room, none no hindrance in the room. Father, we're going to move into a place of 
of delight and of joy, not from past experiences or past losses or past lack of encounters. We're moving into a new moment, a new day. Because Holy Spirit, you are generating something in us out of love that's creating a hope that's allowing our faith to rise. If you have said things against somebody, towards somebody, whether you think you're right or wrong and it did damage, own it. I'm done. in your heart before the Lord to say I will go to that person and I will ask for forgiveness and I'll settle it once and for all now if it's real you're good if you're hedging on it don't take communion tonight but here's the biggest one this is what I when I was reading scripture tonight the biggest one that we struggle with is we take the cup and we break and we we take of the bread we partake of the bread his body and the cup which is his blood and we take it unworthily this is really good news it's not your faithfulness that makes you worthy it's his faithfulness that makes you worthy the kicker is we've got to accept his work his faithfulness his worthiness as our own and know that it's a settled work so we can engage in communion with him. Biggest lie the enemy has is you're not worthy of that. That actually is making a mockery of his body and of his blood when you see yourself as not worthy of his body and his blood when he sees it as a great cost and that he did it because you and I were worthy of that sort of price. So Father, tonight individually in this house, and you pray, you fill in the blanks. But Father, whatever it is that you're revealing in us, we want to settle that. We want to settle that right now. There's some things we can settle once and for all took care of some things once and for all then there's other things that you will continue through the days months and years as you bring them up here's our commitment to you today as you bring them up we will function in the ministry of reconciliation and we will reconcile those things we want to be found faithful but we know it's not dependent upon our faithfulness it's dependent upon your faithfulness it's in that faithfulness that we trust we find our life breath, our being.